Hello all, welcome to the podcast, Doug Padgett here. I'm going to be interviewing Christine Sign here in just a moment. She's written a book called The Gift of Wonder, Creative Practices for Delighting in God. Can't wait for you to hear it. Thank the world of Christine. And here she is. A pleasure to have you uh, chatting with me today. I, I've uh, long thought the world of you, and uh, now to be able to talk to you about this book is even even more exciting. So congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to be with you. Uh, you you currently find yourself in uh, in Texas, uh, but you that but that's not where you live. Tell us a little bit about about home for you, both your current home now and sort of you know your life as a as a person growing up and what you've considered home because I think your own story is so fascinating. Well, I currently live in Seattle. Um, have lived there now for twenty six years with my husband, author Tom Sign. Uh, but you're right, I didn't grow up there. Um, Tom often tells people that I grew up in the deep south. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in Australia, uh, trained there as a medical doctor, then actually moved to New Zealand, was in practice in New Zealand for a couple of years and then kind of got itchy feet. Um, like most Australians, you know, Australians are the most traveled people in the world. So I got itchy feet and decided to join an organization called Youth with a Mission, which at that point in time had just purchased a ship with the intention of building a hospital on board and doing uh, cleft lip and palate and medical work in uh, third world countries. Mm -hmm. So I um, actually had the privilege and not always the delight, but sometimes the delight of setting up a hospital on board literally from scratch uh, and developing a ministry to do cleft lip and palate and eye wow. surgery. So have worked all over the world. Christine, I feel like I've known that that story about you for a long time. And I don't know when that was. What, when, when, when were you doing that on the ship? And I joined it at the beginning of 1981 and left it in 92 when Tom and I were married. So 12 years. And my email is uh, seasickdoctor at gmail.com because I never got over my seasickness. <laughs> Seasick uh, doctor. That's still your email address, really? <laughs> Still, my Fantastic. email address because you know that's um, an experience you never forget. Twelve years of seasickness. Yes. Well. Well. Sometime <laughs> when we're together, I'll t I, I was not. I was only on a boat for three hours, but I had seasickness for three hours. I I agree with you. It's unbelievable. Can't imagine you having to do that while you were also caring for these people on the ship. Like, how did you? How did you focus your mind to deal well, with your um, own? Of course, you know we didn't operate when the ship was at sea. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was important. I actually, um, after the hospital was set up and things were going, I found a lot of ways not to sail. Uh, and wow. there was always somebody who was interested in taking my bed. Hmm. And so I would fly between ports. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 yeah you're smart, too. <laughs> hey, um, in 19, I, I, I really don't know much about uh, that kind of work being done and people touring uh, the country and doing you know, cleft palate reconstruction, but it seems early for 1991 to be doing that. Were, were you sort of on the front edge, kind of on the front cusp of that kind of um, work? There were other, it's something that has long been recognized as a huge need, that kind mm -hmm. of surgery. Um, but I think in many ways, I think um, the ship I was on, which has become Mercy Ships, uh, has been one that has given a much greater profile to this. Yeah. Uh, in fact, one of the great things I did was in 1984, I recruited a maxillofacial surgeon mm. called Dr. Gary Parker, who mm. is still working with the ship ministry. Wow. Uh, wow. Married on board, brought up his family on board. Amazing guy, probably the most experienced cleft lip and palate surgeon in the world. And now um, doesn't just do cleft lip and palate, but absolutely amazing surgeries mm. that they do to bring... Uh, new life to people. Yeah, uh, incredible. Yeah, it really is. I also worked in the refugee camps on the Thai Cambodian border for a short time. So I've had um, unusual <laughs> and sometimes very challenging life experiences. Yes. Um, and and now and now you're in Seattle in the Seattle yes. area. And and how do you spend your time uh, there in Seattle? Uh, well, these days, writing, uh, mm -hmm. working in the garden. And looking after our golden retriever, um, Goldie. Yeah. <laughs> I you... had to hesitate because we had a previous one called Bonnie, but this is Goldie. So oh. she's a delight. Yeah. Um, still still a little sadness around not having, still a little sadness about not having Bonnie around though? 
Yeah, yeah, you know, I think your first dog is always a special love mm. in a lot of ways. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, you, you have done a lot of work and you've written a lot of things. Um, you've you've written for organizations. You've written on the internet. You travel. You speak. And you you turned your sight uh, to this book called The Gift of Wonder. And if I could, just in the introduction, and it's also on the back cover, so it feels like it's an important part of the book. You write this this little bit where you say, "I grew up with a serious workaholic type God who chased who chased chastened me for not keeping busy twenty four hours a day, seven days a week." Even when I realized that God wasn't really like that, it was hard to change. I felt guilty when I slowed down, took a break, or just went out and had fun. This following Jesus is serious business, after all. And um, I bring that up because your uh, your life story, too, is one, like even what you've just introduced so far, that's consequential stuff, traveling around the, the world and helping people with uh, facial reconstruction and working in refugee camps and I just think about all the people who have, rec- have uh, awakened to so many of the struggles in our world and want to be activists and how uh, for a lot of us, I f- certainly feel this. I felt it just yesterday, this kind of heavy weight of, hey, we don't have time to just sit around and, and kind of, you know, crap away our lives. We've got to be doing the things to, to heal the world. You know, the, the kind of call that we hear from our Jewish brothers and sisters to, you know, the, that the call of God is that we would participate with God to heal the world. God, that's a lot of burden uh, also, right? And it, it just never relents. Like it's, it lays on top of someone like a heavy, wet blanket. Um, and you've tried to do something in this book that actually comes out of your, your life. And you say in the book that writing the book also helps you do these practices better, which is, is wonderful. Uh, but what, what sort of led you to the place where uh, what you write about in the book of wanting to engage with yourself and with God in a way that is fun and is in, in, uh, 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 enlightening and enjoyable and all those kinds of things. Like what, what, how, how did you let go of that? My, my phrase, that big heavy blanket that, of, of weight and concern that can lay over someone. Well, it took a lot of years. Um, probably I would say it started in the refugee camps where somebody introduced us to Henry Nouwen Uh, You know, because all of us were grappling with kind of how do you carry this heavy burden? How do you do this work in this kind of horrible situation where you're constantly hearing stories of, oh, you know, of of suffering? Um, And so I think it was from that that some of us started to get into more contemplative kind of practices. Um, And then, you know, after uh, Tom and I were married, I started to... Uh, do more research, got introduced to the, you know, the Jewish idea of healing the world, uh, that I wasn't just a physician, but I was somebody who was called to yeah. heal the world. And part of that, I think, is not just to help heal, find healing physically, but spiritually as well. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of looking for what are the healing practices to a mm-hmm. certain extent. You know, I got introduced to Lectio Divina. I got introduced to, to labyrinth walking. I got introduced to some of these more contemplative kind of practices. Um, but I think, you, you know, the this book really came out of probably two or three years ago now. I was just riveted one day by the expression, unless you become like a child, you cannot yeah. enter the kingdom. And I started to think about, you know, <laughs> what are the childlike characteristics and what's childlike about my faith? Uh, now, nothing much childlike about my faith at that point. So oh. I actually posted it on Facebook, mm-hmm. you know, kind of, <laughs> yeah. what do you think of the childlike characteristics? And I was amazed at the response I got, um, you know, the play, curiosity, imagination, love of nature, uh, just the list went on and on. So I decided to choose 12 of those characteristics that people had mentioned, do some research uh, and look at, um, you know, kind of the impact of these things and how can we incorporate them into our, our faith. Um, it, it was a fun project. Um, you know, I started with play. I think that's the one we all love to start with. Um, but, you know, the Stuart Brown, the leader of the, um, I think it's the National Institute for Play, says nothing lights up the brain like mm. play. And he says he believes that play is probably God's greatest gift to humankind. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is amazing. And he says it's as important as oxygen right. for it. And I think, uh-huh, 
I think, you know, and this was kind of, you could say, my key to thinking, wow, I really need to get into um, this business of child likeness and not just researching it, but starting to incorporate it in what I did. Um, and I'd already started some practices like mm -hmm. painting on rocks and uh, doodling and particularly encouraged by a friend of mine who was an expressive arts therapist and oh, did yeah. this kind of thing with kids, you know. Yeah, right, and so right. she was encouraging me. She'd give yeah. me children's books to read and she'd kind of, you know, encourage me with all these kind of practices. And I, I, not only did I start to incorporate some of them into my life, but I noticed that uh, the burden started to lift mm. because I was starting to see God in a different way, not as a hard taskmaster, but as somebody who really wanted us to enjoy life, to have fun, um, and who wanted to have fun with us mm. along the way. And it was just inspiring kind of experience. Like it, um, it strikes me that in some ways you were also having to say, to yourself that you didn't want to see your own self as a taskmaster. Yes. I mean, oh yeah. It... Because I've laid some heavy, heavy burdens on <laughs> right. other people at times yeah. too. I think yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's it really goes in both directions. It does. Yeah. And, and I, I've just found that for uh, so many of us, uh, myself included, we, we end up, we end up being the primary voice in our own head that we might attribute to God, but we're sort of like the drill sergeant uh, mm -hmm. in our own heads, right? Telling ourselves that you have to do more, you have to work harder. And even some of the the practices that you said you, you were familiar with, you know, from years ago from Henry Now and others, things like contemplation and meditation and Lectio. Now I, I do all those things, but uh -huh. by no measure are they counted in my uh, list of things as fun, right? Uh -huh. Like, <laughs> Like nobody, nobody sort of gets a big smile. Nobody giggles like we are right now in a meditation thing. Good. I've done a lot of Lectio and it's just heavy most of the time. Like it's, it's quiet. It's contemplative. It's serious. It's a little more library than playground uh -huh. at the school. You know, I'm like, if you take a, a, your average school and think you have classrooms, the library and the playground and different things happen in those different places, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of curious that, that often, you know, meditation becomes part of the library and learning becomes part of the classroom. And the playground is like a half an hour that you get maybe if you eat your lunch fast enough. Uh, <laughs> and your book seems to, and I'm, I'm curious about this, that, that you're sort of pushing into this idea of, of, uh, enjoyment um, mm -hmm. You call it the the gift of wonder. Uh, I was struck as my, I think that's a great title. I think it really captures it. But it, it, it doesn't have the wonder. When I first saw the title and thought about it, I thought, well, maybe Christine is talking about the practice of um, imagination, mm -hmm. which is part uh, that's there. But mm -hmm. what I was just more captivated by was the, the idea of engagement and, like you said, play or um, uh, sort of participation and, you know, coming to a table and embracing and seeing and do like it was very it's much more active than just mental um, kind of wonder, yes. kind of wonderment. D d d is that is that how you're thinking about the book or what you were doing when you were writing? Oh, definitely. And it's interesting. I don't know if you know the name Christine Baltus Paintner. Uh, she was the one who um, really helped me to see Lectio Divina in a much more fun way. She has a wonderful Facebook group that she calls the Holy Disorder of Dancing Monks. Really? Uh, now, that in itself is a fun title. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, she um, does a lot of work with art and with dance and with poetry and, you know, kind of she helped me to see Lectio Divina not just some, as something that you do sitting in a room kind of looking at the words, but as something you do as you walk around uh, the neighborhood noticing things mm. um, and and kind of having some fun interpreting what God is saying in the midst of that, you know, yeah. I mean, it, which kind of led me to the thing of, well, if I walk around this neighborhood, um, in fact, was was then probably walking with Mark Scandrett around San Francisco and looking at all the murals, the incredible oh. murals that have been painted on some of the walls yeah, yeah. and kind of using those in a contemplative way but mm. in a kind of a, a fun, light mm. kind of an experience that made me think beyond Lectio Divina as this really serious kind yeah. of, um, yeah. you know, business to something that helps us notice the world around us in a better way and in a different way. Mm. I mean, um, 
one of the things that I find is that Lectio Divina opened me to noticing the world. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And now I, I notice it in um, all kinds of different ways. I mean, I love when I sit in the plane, I always ask for a window seat and I love to look down and see what I can see. I mean, the other day, um, flying to Texas, looking down and seeing this meandering uh, river pattern with the, the sun shining on it and thinking, oh, there's God doodling, you know, and, and thinking about <laughs> that in nice that phrase. fun kind of way. Yeah. Um, it, it's Lectio Divina, but it's Lectio Divina in a totally kind of different kind of interpretation of it, I suppose you could say. Well, I also find I find that interesting because um, today is, uh, you know, when we're recording this, it's uh, I don't know March twenty eighth, which is the opening day of baseball, which doesn't mean ah. any, doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not a I'm not a sports follower. <laughs> no, so. I'm not a baseball fan. I confess to being a cricket fan, though. Oh, there, but... <laughs> is is there an opening? Is there an opening day coming for the cricket, the international uh, cricket season? Well, no. <laughs> it's they play a summer, the, the summer sport. Well, uh, so I heard someone uh, on a on a television thing this morning reflecting on, and there it's, it's a political show and, and he was talking about how great baseball is. Uh, and he said, you know, it's this wonderful break that we have this little moment where we can take a break from the realities of the world so that we can, you know, uh, sort of be refreshed to basically come back to the gigantic nightmare that uh, has become the, the way the world is uh, specifically with the Trump administration. Others what he was talking about, but that's a view of play of enjoyment that is a break that is this is what you do to refresh yourself so you can lay back under the big heavy wet blanket of of responsibility Mm -hmm. i think you're saying something else i think you're saying there's a way and the, the gift of wonder wants the book wants people to sort of develop a set of practices so that they see the world as it really is and find enjoyment and play and pleasure in that, not, not as a break from it. Am yes. I, am I on to something there? Is that, is that what you're, what you're wanting? Well, and not just play. I mean, I think particularly wonder or mm-hmm. and wonder is a very good example mm-hmm. of this. You know, I mean, Um, We look at, um, for example, last year, I I was actually writing this book at the time of the um, eclipse last year. And of course, up in Seattle, I mean, we had like 98% eclipse. I mean, it was just phenomenal, not just watching it, but watching the response of people. Uh, And, you know, watching the response of people to the breaking forth of spring and these kind of things that we all just so love. But... um, uh, Father Greg Boyle says to take that sense of wonder and apply it, mm. uh, you know, to the poor and to the homeless and such so that you're not just gazing at these things that have a wonderful sense of enjoyment, you know, kind of with awe and wonder, but you're actually looking at people with that. And mm. and so often um, it brings a sense of enjoyment in that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, I mean, we tend to look at people who are poor. We we add to our burden because we think, oh, what on earth can I do to help this person? Or, you know, the homeless. Mm-hmm. And you think, oh, what on earth can I do? But if we look at that person and are kind of looking at awe and wonder at their resilience and their approach to life, I mean, you know, you go into poor communities and people are laughing and they're enjoying life. And so entering into that enjoyment that's often Mm -hmm. already there, Mm -hmm. uh, rather than kind of taking our burdens with us and kind of trying to put those burdens onto others as well, I think is part of what I'm recognizing more and more. You know, we need to look for one of my friends calls the joy spots. What are the joy spots? Yeah. You Uh, call it, you call it joy spotting in the book, right? Like it's it's an activity of joy spotting. Yeah. Yeah. A friend of mine used that and I thought, well, if we look for the joy spots and then look at how can we enter the joy spots and bring others into those joy spots, uh, rather than, you know, that, yeah, heavy burden I, lay. I'm sure you have had to say this to yourself uh, and maybe to others, but um, what talking do you do to yourself or others to help them not feel like that is trivializing or sort of, um, you know, whistling in the graveyard kind of a, <laughs> like we have all these all these um, responses and uh, sayings that are meant to combat people that find joy in the midst of suffering to be like, oh, they're just Pollyannish. They're, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're not taking the world seriously. Well, how do you help somebody who has those, those voices just coming up so quickly 
every time they think about wonder, enjoyment, joy spotting, play in the midst of all the struggle to start to set that aside and find a way to, you know, not be so burdened by the burdens. Well, actually, I think maybe we need a few more Pollyannas because, I mean, you know, it's funny because we look at Pollyanna and we think she's got this artificial kind of joy. But what happens, you know, you look in the book, is that she transformed others because of that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah I've never actually read the book. Isn't that hilarious? Yeah. <laughs> I, only, I only know her as an insult term that somebody's being Pollyanna. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it, Which is sad, you know, yeah. that we've made it kind of an insult term mm-hmm. because the whole thing is that, you know, I mean, um, people's lives were transformed because Uh she had this attitude towards Mm -hmm. them because she went in with joy and often transferred that joy to them. Um, And it didn't mean that she, um, you know, and I think for us moving it away from Pollyanna, because it's a very long time since I read Pollyanna. um, But, you know, part of what I notice is that joy is contagious. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, when we go in with joy, um, we can help, transform people and I think when people are transformed situations Mm. are often transformed as well um you know when we when we see the little bit that's already being done that's kind of full of joy we can multiply that I mean I think that's part of what Jesus did Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. I mean I think he was a very joyful person um I I, you know I think he had an enthusiasm for life a childlike enthusiasm Mm. um that transformed people and often it's the kids that were transformed first. I mean, that's part of what, uh, as I worked on this book, part of what I started to notice is how often um, there are references to children. You know, I mean, for example, I don't know, most people have never noticed this and I hadn't noticed it until I read it in a book one of my, that I was researching, that when Jesus goes in to overturn uh, the, the tables, the money lenders, you know, and it says, and the children, uh, circled around and shouted Hosanna to the king. And then it says, and the leaders got angry. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but basically. I know that. And, and wow. the author that I was reading said it was only the kids wow. that could recognize the awe and wonder of what Jesus was doing. Huh. Um, and I think, and, and after reading that, I started to kind of rethink some of the parables of Jesus with a kind of awe and wonder lens Mm -hmm. uh, and and maybe also drawing on some of my images from from, um, working in Africa, you know, where you're constantly surrounded by kids. Um, And the story in particular that I think of is the fish and the loaves. You know, we so often we see these images, here's Jesus, here are all the disciples, all the adults and one kid. And I think, no, no way. <laughs> you know, I bet those kids, you know, I bet there was a whole gaggle of kids. Oh, they all came probably pushing their friend forward, excited and giggling and laughing. And just as in the um, the temple with the money changers, I suspect that only the kids believed that Jesus could perform a miracle, you know, and it says that the disciples Mm. are there saying, oh, you know, how are we going to find enough food for 5,000 people? It's too far to go to buy food. And, you know, I mean, that's all of what they're doing. And the kids are kind of saying, come on, Jesus, do a miracle, do a miracle. We know you can do it, you know. Mm. And I think that um, so often that childlike enthusiasm you know, just like we dismiss Pollyanna, mm-hmm. uh, we we dismiss anybody with childlike enthusiasm. Right, right. Because we're too caught up in the seriousness and we, we don't tend to believe that Jesus can perform miracles anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, whatever. I, I mean, I know you can rationalise what happened. Now, to be honest, I've seen miracles happen. I don't believe we have to rationalise those things. Mm-hmm. Once upon a time, I would have tried to. But I do believe that you know, we believe in a, a, an awe-inspiring God who still go, does miracles if we will just go with that childlike enthusiasm mm. uh, to, to believe that it's possible, you know? Yeah. I, I think about the, you know, the, a lot of friends right now that have children, our kids are now older, and um, you kind of notice when a parent has a serious child, like sometimes, uh-huh. some, like not every kid is fun loving, right? Some, yep. even sometimes kids are sort of just temperamentally, right? And there's just people that are temperamentally a little more reserved and serious. And, um, I wonder if, 
if some of this is that in all human beings of sort of all ages, we have to practice up, we have to nurture up, we have to um, sort of care for and lift up the kinds of uh, practices that you talk about in the book, because in the book you have a set of practices that follow each of your uh, each of these areas of, of discussion. And I think about that word practice, like it's really common in spirituality terms, you know, we talk about Christian practices, but if you think about in, in, in music or in sports, you'll say the word, let's play. Like if, uh-huh. if when I play basketball, you'd play basketball, but sometimes you'd have pat, you'd have uh, practice like yes. doing drills and people that practice their guitar do that so that when time comes to get the band together, they have a chance to play and they yes. call it playing and they call it, maybe they call it rehearsing on a, in a drama, but then you go to the play. And that's, I, that's, I'd never thought of that, Doug, but you're right. You're rehearsing to play. Yes. And I think that, uh, uh, yeah, we, we kind of got it, tend to get it the wrong way around. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. It's really curious, isn't it? Like, yeah. um, so I just, I, I, I've, I just know so many people, um, temperamentally aren't easygoing or comfortable with themselves and are really self-conscious. Like even some of the practices in here where they would think about walking down their street and noticing cracks in the street or something and seeing what comes out or <laughs> starting to doodle or color. Like I'm a terrible drawer personally and bad. I can't even color inside the lines. I don't know. It's an eye hand. Well, problem I don't thing. like to color inside the lines either. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, good. So you can see like, you see those people that get like those coloring books and they're really good or they do a mandala or something and they're just gorgeous. And even in the play world, it can become so self-conscious and just any self-expression, any sort of fun. And there seems to be something in our society, and maybe it's different in Australian culture that you were raised in, where there's a little bit more of a easygoing nature. But boy, a lot of people I know just feel a lot of self-conscious burden, a lot of you know temperamental restraint. Um, mm-hmm. kind of, kind of holding them back. Do, uh, are the practices that you have in the book, do you, do you, have you found, uh, have you done these with people? Do you find that they help someone to learn that the way that rehearsing or practicing would allow them to start to engage? Well, I think, you know, you know, people play in different ways and I like to have different kinds of practices available for people. Um, but I, I do think, you know, I think Part of the problem, and I think Australian culture is going in the same way as American culture, is we actually, we play to compete. Oh, nice. uh, Rather than playing to play. You know, I mean, you even look at it, I I know, um, you go on Pinterest, and as you said, you look at the mandalas, they're always absolutely perfect. (laughs) You know, I mean, I make a mandala, and I smudge, and I, so I post them like that. You know, because it's it's like we don't need to see yet another perfect mandala. We need to see mm. somebody who's having fun playing with it. You know, I make these contemplative gardens uh, and I put my stones that I've I've decorated into them. The letters aren't perfect mm. that, because that's not the purpose. I'm not trying to compete with somebody else to produce something. I'm trying, you know, firstly, it's fun for me to create it, yeah. particularly not with that pressure of this has got to look perfect. You know, if I kind of allow that pressure to absorb myself, um, then I, I, I'll never, firstly, it won't be fun, yeah, you right, know. Right. And then secondly, um, I, I will get into that competitive mode. Oh, look, that person on Pinterest got one that looks far better than the one I did. I'm mm-hmm. going to have to do it again mm-hmm. type of thing. And, th- and that's not the purpose. You know, when kids play, um, they're not competing with each other. Mm-hmm. You know, we've made play into competition. Um, you know, but the kind of what what the play that I'm talking about mm-hmm. is unfettered play with no mm. real goal in mind, you know, no competition. Uh, no, you've got to get through this game. You've got to get, you know, you've got to win. You've got to kind of do better or something like that. It's, it's not like that. Um, and I think that we've kind of distorted play. We've, we've distorted play or in wonder we've we've distorted all of these kinds of things that that i talk about in the book i i think you know and i think that's part of the tragedy of it the the book uh for people that are just uh listening now is called the gift of wonder it came out just on tuesday so it's brand new i'm pleased to have one in my hand uh one of the the things that you do is you give people these um what feel to me like this wonderful sort of counter stretch in, in the yoga world, right? Like you stretch. So it says rest in the moment. And the practice is walking in circles. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> right, right. Like that's that's a that's a clever um, that's a clever way to like it says cultivate gratitude and plan a scavenger hunt. Uh-huh. Well, for a lot of people, a scavenger hunt is a real kind of anxiety producing thing, right? <laughs> and you're like, no, that's a way that you get to gratitude. If you want to rest, walk in circles for a while. So, uh-huh. so there's something sort of um, uh, like the 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 wisdom that comes from a counterintuitive uh, uh, take on this. Well, and maybe that's just a part of who I am. You know, firstly, I'm an Australian, and Australians like to do things differently. Yeah, you know, your, your, I mean, we your like toilet to water be, runs the other direction. Like, <laughs> uh, the pot, yes. <laughs> I mean, what, like yeah. when I was a kid, the one thing I learned about Australia was not only the, what, you know, hear the the accent that's so attractive to many American voices. For some reason, when I was a kid, they were like, "Oh yeah," and the toilet water runs the uh, spins the other. <laughs> Like I had no, I don't even know what direction my toilet water spins in, but that's a thing I know about that Australians just have this other way of kind of viewing the world. It's really, really wonderful. It, it is too. But you, you know, it's interesting. You look at a kid when a kid's resting, um, mm. you, most of them aren't sitting still. I mean, mm-hmm. it's interesting when, um, when I was in medical practice, I still remember a pediatrician that I worked with. He said he never put kids on bed rest. Because he said bed rest for a kid was normal activity three feet above the ground. You know, because they just can't <laughs> sit there still. And if they're tired, you know, they'll rest. If they're not, they, they're active. And I think that to me, there's a certain element of that mm. uh, in what I call resting in the moment. Mm. You know, when we rest, it's not that we've got to stand still. Because for some of us, me included, you probably notice I. Um, yeah. I'm always moving. Um, and, you know, to to sit rigidly still is not rest for me. Mm. It's tension-filled feeling. Yeah. So I think yeah. that we all need to find what is it that gives us that sense of rest, and it's different for different people. Um, you know, I do, I, I love, um, I'm here in Waco, Texas, and I've been walking like at, at sunset, you know, watching the um the sun set in these magnificent, huge oak trees. Um, and that's rest for me, you know, to walk and to do that. Uh, I could just sit uh, and look yeah. at it too. That would be rest as well. But I think that we need to have a sense of what it is that gives our bodies and our souls and our spirits rest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, And that's not necessarily sitting still. Uh, you know, it depends on our personalities. Mm. An introvert might like to sit still, an extrovert probably doesn't, mm-hmm. you know. So mm-hmm. we've got to um, kind of give ourselves the freedom to yeah. work on what we personally mm. uh, delight in in this way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, this might not connect too much, but I, I follow a person that uh, is an ultra runner, means he runs really, really long races. Uh-huh. And one, one of his um, uh, statements about what helps somebody to run a lot. He runs seven days a week. And he says, you'll hear people say that you need to have a day of rest, a day mm-hmm. off. And he says, physiologically, your body doesn't need a day off is his argument. What your body needs is eight hours of full sleep. Uh-huh. That uh-huh. what that's the thing that really does it right. That you get well, that, that, that you, all the benefits of sleep happen. And then you can sort of keep going. What, what he's getting at is that we all think that we've managed up some way of figuring out what actually rests our body and replenishes us. Yes. Um, for him, it's activity. It's, you know, it's, it's running and sleep. And he's, I think he's probably right. in you know, when it comes to the, the physiology of the body as well, that it's that sleep that people need. So, you and it feels like you're getting at something sort of similar, right? Like find the find the nourishment and the replenishment that gives your life uh, uh, energy, and not fall into a pattern. Because I could yeah. imagine somebody who you know, while while for you sitting still would be anxiety producing, it is for me as well. Uh, that for other people, they may have to overcome some anxiety to engage in some of the practices that you talk about here in the book, right? They 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 may have to they may have to work at that a bit. Uh, to to get out of their minds and into their bodies, because almost all of these uh, practices and the descriptions and the, uh, or the the categories in the book feel like they involve your body in some way, um, not not to your mind, but sort of leading with sight and sound and touch and movement and uh, tactileness and 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 that your mind is uh, is not the first and foremost. But boy, there's a lot of people who just organize their life first by their thoughts. 
and then their well, thoughts about their thoughts and then the way they think about they f- think about their feelings about their thoughts you know well and i think it's you know one of the to me one of the tragedies of faith mm. <laughs> as we practice it is we've made it into a very mind oriented kind mm. of practice you know i mean for most of us um you, you know we read the Bible, we pray, and of course we close our eyes so that we're not distracted. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we so often miss all the things that I think are, are, are meant to be part of our mm-hmm. prayer experience. You know, um, I think that prayer should engage all of our senses. Mm-hmm. Um, and so sight and sound and touch and, uh, you know, taste and, you know, obviously not always all at once. Yeah. But I think that these are the things um, that, you, you know, can be involved in our prayers. Yeah, um, yeah. Should be involved in our prayers. Um, it makes me think of a friend at our church that writes a song, a song that he wrote that we sing together. And it's, it, uh, it basically is, be careful little hands that you touch. Be careful mm-hmm. little ears that you hear. Be careful little eyes that you see. Or you might miss that what's going on instead of the hear no evil, see no evil, t- t- uh, touch no or uh, taste no evil. He's like, no, be, really practice up. Be careful to see. Be careful yeah. to hear. Be careful. Uh, put your care that direction. That's a, that's a nice. I, I feel like that's some of what you're what that. you're getting yes. at too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's the, that, that's very much the way that I feel. Mm. Um, that you know we should be engaging all of our senses. Mm. Uh, you know, our bodies aren't meant to sit still. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, you know, I, I mean, as a physician, you know, I love to research different things. And one of the things that they they say is that, um, you know, people who are sedentary, in other words, don't move their bodies at all, mm-hmm. uh, you know, are usually not as healthy, of course, as mm-hmm. people who move. And that's not going out and running. But, you know, people that cross their legs and, uh, mm. you know, move around as they're sitting even, mm. uh, some of the research shows that they're healthy wow. as oh, a result of that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, and I think that the more um, of yeah. our senses that we stimulate, and, and I haven't got exact documentation of this, but the more of our senses we stimulate, I think the more healthy we are, not just physically, but I think spiritually too, because that's part of the way that God has designed us. You know, I mean, I'm fascinated by um, some of the research into uh, the impact of nature, mm. you know, on our health, for example, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to the extent that um, they've found that kids that spend, like urban kids, uh, you know, in, in poor schools, for example, in poor communities, um, studies that have been done, particularly in Europe, show that if kids can get out in nature for a certain amount of time, that their health is mm. dramatically improved. Mm. Um, and so, and, and it's that stimulus, you know, it's, it's because they've kind of been trained, uh, well, people try to train them just to focus on their minds, you know, but that stimulus of, um, you know, getting out and looking, as you said, and hearing. I mean, people in hospital, they say that if they've got a window and they can look out on nature, they recover faster than if they don't. <laughs> it just seems so obvious, doesn't it? And yet it's shocking. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Well, because I think God has designed us uh, to interact with nature, mm. you know. Now, that doesn't mean we all need to love hiking and yeah. we all need to, you know, want to go on a great um, mountain trek or something like that. But I think, uh, you know, we need to find ways mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. interact with nature. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of who God has created us to be, you know. I mean, the first thing God did was create a garden and then place <laughs> us in that garden, yeah, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I saw a bumper sticker once that said, God's original plan was to hang out uh, in a garden with two naked vegetarians. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a fun, that's a fun way to think about. It. All right, so in the book, I, I, this is sort of a I don't know. Maybe you have an answer for this. You you list out these um, you know the set of a set of practices, some of which you you sort of crowdsourced from the internet and asking uh-huh. people what what captured up that sense of wonderment. Um, is there one in particular that for you is sort of the least sort of Christine Aroni sign where you're like, <laughs> okay, that that one. Um, uh, that that's the one that comes more difficult uh, to me or for me. Is is there one that's oh. a little little more off uh, off your your center? Yeah, life? I 
Um, I don't know because I've probably chosen things that, you know, things sure. that I yeah. think, oh, that's fun. You yeah, know, right. I mean, some of them are a little more challenging than others. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, um, for example, the in the last chapter, I talk about braiding uh, a cord, you know. Now, yeah. I love knitting, but braiding is actually a lot more meticulous to me and not quite something that, uh, you know, I would naturally get into. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, which may sound a bit strange. But one of the things I found already, because, you know, I've got a number of people that have gotten early copies of this book, and some of them are, uh, you know, doing the uh, exercises, and others have taken the exercises and have kind of, you know, gone on from there and have created their own kind mm. of forms of them, I which I love. You know, I think that um, some of the purpose of the exercises is not necessarily to say, you've got to do this. Right. And right, you've got sure. to do it the way I say yes. to. But, hey, here's an idea. What does it stir in you and how could you go on from here? I mean, for example, um, reading the chapter on play, one woman decided to, she created a game uh, for a retreat she was doing where she got some big dice, or she made cardboard dice, I think about six inches square, uh, cube, I should say, wrote words on each side. And so each mm. person at the retreat had to throw the two dice and then take the ideas that came up and write a story. Wow. And, uh, isn't that fun? You know, so great. Or, or they had to do something with it. I don't think they always, you know, they could choose what they did, but they had to come up with a story or something else from the ideas and and I thought you know all I did was suggest play and I'd given some mm-hmm, some mm-hmm. ideas on on that but but you know it stirred something totally different and I think that that's for me the purpose of these things is take an idea and run with it not just do it you know I I think we so often work inside the rules. Yeah, right. Because I'm an Australian, I think we uh, <laughs> we, we need to go outside the rules. <laughs> I think there's even a restaurant. Isn't the Outback like something about that? Isn't that the slogan of some Australian restaurant? Like no rules here or something? Yeah, very. It could be. It, yeah, I, it I, I, I like, can't yeah. remember. That sounds like the sort of thing. All right, so, so the book is called uh, The Gift of Wonder. If people want to know more about this or they connect with the book, how do they find you? What's the best way to do that? And are you going to be traveling around anywhere? that people around the country could find you and meet you and say hello? Well, I'm actually this weekend, I am at the new story festival in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then next month, at the end of the month, I will be at the inhabit conference in Seattle, Washington, Right, which is one of the most fun conferences I go to. And I've gotten a lot of ideas from there and from the people that I meet. Yeah. Great. Um, You know, I, I love to see the creativity that people have. Um, I uh, run a, a blog called GodSpaceLight.com, uh, and you know, obviously, L I L I T E L I G H T. What L I G H T? So it's one word: G O D S P A C E L I G H T. Dot com, and you know, a lot of the ideas I get, and a lot of the responses that people. Are giving to the book will be posted on that blog um, mm-hmm. as time goes on. So, and they could find out information from that. Obviously, it's available on Amazon. Yep, uh, it's listed as the number one uh, release in rituals and routines, or something like that. At the really moment. great. Yeah. Yeah, I hope you. I hope you got a screenshot of that. And you, you, I did. You, you, good, I did. good. Yeah, that's that's the kind of thing you can carry around and say the number one best-selling author in uh, on Am- Amazon's number I, I one thought, best-selling this is author. Probably a very small category, but it's still fun. You it's know? still fun. It's still a category. Yeah, that's that's super great. Well, and that's exactly the kind of thing your book is getting at is just you know find a little fun. Well, Christine uh, Roney Sign uh, is the author of The Gift of Wonder, creating creative practices for delighting in God. And I would also say uh, for delighting in yourself and your neighbor and your, in your neighborhood and the world and all of it. So congratulations. It's a great book and I hope people, uh, hope people find it and enjoy it. Well, thank you, Doug. Thank you. I had so too.